Hello, friends, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Apu Kotecha. I teach finance at Northeastern University. We are gathered here today to talk to Professor Viral Acharya. Friends, thanks for joining us for what promises to be a most illuminative discussion. Before we begin, as Magda mentioned, some housekeeping instructions. This session is being recorded and you should be able to view it via YouTube once we put it on there. In the meanwhile, please turn off your audio and video feeds. And lastly, uh, later in this discussion, we're gonna have a Q and A session. And so please send your questions for Professor Acharya into the chat room so we can ask them with him. Now, the first thing I would like to do is thank the two co-hosts of today's session. The first is Northeastern University's CEM, or the Center for Emerging Markets. And the other co-host is the Boston chapter of Pratham USA. CEM is the Center for Emerging Markets at the Damore McKim School of Business at Northeastern University. It conducts and disseminates research on how local and foreign firms can leverage emerging markets for the greater good. It was founded in 2007 by Ravi Ramamurthy, the University Distinguished Professor of International Business and Strategy at Northeastern. CEM's main goals are discovery through research, education for students, and dissemination for practitioners. CEM is a leading center of its kind in the US with a reputation for cutting edge research, particularly on internationalization strategy, technology and innovation, as well as corporate governance. The other co-host for today is the Boston chapter of Pratham USA. Pratham itself was originally a charity that was started in India in 1995 with the aim of providing education to children living in the slums of Mumbai. Today, Pratham is one of the largest and most successful non-governmental education organizations in India. It has delivered quality education programming over the last 25 years to over 75 million children. Pratham works in collaboration with governments, with communities, parents, teachers, as well as volunteers. Pratham focuses on innovative interventions to address gaps in the education system. Pratham's mission is every child in school and learning well. And this mission drives Pratham's focus to make an impact on the lives of today's children. With that, let's move on to our guest speaker today, Viral Acharya. Viral is the CV Star Professor of Economics in the Department of Finance at NYU's Stern School of Business. He's also an academic advisor, to the Federal Reserve Banks of New York, as well as the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. He was the Deputy Governor at the RBI, or the Reserve Bank of India, from January 2017 to July 2019. There, he was in charge of monetary policy, financial market, financial stability, and research. A couple of personal notes before we go into our main topic today. Viral's father and my father actually went to medical school together, and so I've known Viral since a very young age. And we also share some similarities in our backgrounds. For example, we both graduated from IIT Bombay at slightly different times. Let me share a small anecdote here. When students join IIT and go to the IIT dorms, most of them purchase bicycles right away so that they can travel within the campus. They use these cycles for a couple of months and then the cycles have some problem like a flat tire after which the cycles sit around and collect rust for the remaining part of the four years. Viral and I, both of us, however, used a bicycle pretty regular, religiously for all four of our undergraduate years. Now note that I did not say Viral and I used our bicycles in the plural religiously. I said Viral and I used 
a bicycle religiously because it was the same bicycle. I left India after I finished my IIT and came to the US. And five years later, Viral went to my parents' house, took my bicycle and used it for the next four years in IIT. As I said, we have some similarities in our backgrounds, but we also have some differences. For example, I graduated from IIT Bombay, with perfectly average GPA, while Viral graduated with the presidential gold medal of his batch from IIT Bombay. Another similarity between us, we both got our PhDs in finance from Stern, where both of us had Professor Marty Subramaniam as a guruji and our advisor. Friends, the reason we are here today is to talk a little about this book. It is Viral's latest book, which has been just released, and it's called The Quest for Restoring Financial Stability in India. It contains his speeches while he was at RBI. In addition, he has added an introductory new chapter titled Fiscal Dominance, A Theory of Everything in India. Good afternoon, Viral. Are you on mute, Viral? Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon. Can hear you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, very, uh, very delighted to be here and look forward to the interaction, Apu. Little delighted to have you. And uh, let's start with the questions right away. So Viral, when I look at the title of this book, the first question that comes to mind is, in your opinion, is India financially unstable? Uh, so I, I describe uh, in the book um, that uh, crises in India, bank, especially banking crises in India happen as what I call as a silent crisis. Uh, and the main reason why this happens uh, is because big parts of the Indian banking system are owned by the government. So you don't get, uh, when the banking system has uh, run very large uh, quantum of losses or non-performing assets, uh, you don't get the depositors, the liability holders, uh, essentially engaging in the kind of uh, demand for immediacy or runs, as we call it in the banking literature on these banks. Why? Uh, they sit there patiently because they know that the sovereign balance sheet uh, is backing uh, these banks. Now, I want to make two points here that are very crucial, though. Uh, first, uh, which is that just because these banks are stable, uh, the public sector banks, should we consider it as financial stability? And all along my research, uh, both theoretical as well as empirical, I have been arguing that we should not define financial stability as whether banks are being run upon or not. We should define financial stability as whether banks are performing their function of intermediation well to the real economy. And this distinction is crucial because ultimately we care about financial stability if it affects the real economy. And what you observe in India is that public sector banks are safe, but when they are saddled with a huge stock of non-performing assets and they have not been recapitalized by the government, so they're effectively undercapitalized for all practical purposes, uh, that these banks only do two kinds of lending. They do evergreening, so they extend the loans of their defaulted borrowers and pretend as though everything is okay. Uh, it's increasingly called zombie lending, uh, which is you are keeping uh, the dead alive, dead firms alive. Uh, and this is a gross misallocation of capital in the economy. And the second kind of lending that they do is lazy lending. They just go and buy government bonds because in all capital requirements, uh, the world over, there is no capital that is required to be put on balance sheet for holding your government's bonds. So they can just raise deposits, take the money and put it into government bonds. Now, this creates a whole missing middle of lending that doesn't take place. These are the healthier borrowers of the economy, small and medium sized corporation, retail borrowers, and sometimes even actually the relatively healthy borrowers, even if they get credit, they get it at a very high cost. So this is the first important point to make, which is that even if India may not look financially unstable in the traditional notion of financial stability, 
it is quote unquote unstable in the sense that a silent banking crisis is playing out since several years, at least five to six years now, in which big parts of the banking system, 50 to 60% of the deposits of the banking system are in balance sheets that are not lending well to the real economy. And this matters because it ultimately erodes the productive growth capacity of the economy. The second key point that I want to make here is that what is the backing uh, behind these banks? It's the sovereign balance sheet. Now, the sovereign balance sheet has been bleeding on at least two fronts. First and foremost, just the injections into these banks, uh, both direct injections and its opportunity cost, has been on the level of around $100 billion over the last 10 years. And that has not actually covered up the full whole of the non-performing assets. Uh, we still have a huge non-performing assets legacy stock. And now there will be another stock uh, that comes in because of the COVID shock that has hit. And second, simultaneously, the government has been expanding the size of its balance sheet by running more and more and more of welfare programs, which are delivered in the form of various kinds of subsidies. Now, the subsidies create a one-time boost uh, in consumption into the GDP, but it's not like infrastructure. It's not like health. It's not like education. So they don't create big fiscal multipliers for the economy down the line. They don't crowd in too much of private investment. And so on both of these fronts, the fiscal situation of the country is slipping. The true deficit of the economy, so once you take into account all the off-balance sheet uh, shenanigans that governments do to hide their debts and borrowings, uh, it's now on the order of 8 to 10% of GDP. Uh, Post-COVID, the projections are it could easily rise to 14 to 15% of GDP. Uh, the tax collections will come down, so the debt to GDP numbers are likely to rise between 8 to 90 percent of GDP. So what is the sum total of all this is that the fisc, the fiscal side, which is supposed to be backing the banking side, is also not looking as healthy as anymore. It's not yet at a point of uh, anything that looks like a breaking point. But it's entering the levels of fiscal deficits and debt to GDP numbers that economists considered progressively moving in the direction of vulnerability. So the fiscal and the financial, which are intimately tied at the hips in India because of the presence of public sector banks, are now collectively uh, beginning to look more unstable than they were in the past because progressively the fisc is slipping. Whatever has been done for banks has not been decisive enough. And so in my view, the costs of the silent banking crisis and the steady fiscal slippage that has happened on the government side over the last four or five years where the state has become larger and larger and larger are now actually brewing for a while. The COVID shock is very large. And therefore, India, in my view, is at crossroads of whether to actually do banking reforms, whether to do fiscal reforms, so that at least on a medium term sense, India can ensure macroeconomic and financial stability. So you mentioned the fiscal part and you mentioned the financial part, and that brings me to your preface of your book. And in the preface of your book, you have provo provocatively titled it as fiscal dominance the theory of everything in India. Can you explain to our audience what you mean by that? Uh, yes. So, uh, you know, fiscal dominance is, of course, a concept that's been out there in macroeconomics for some time, uh, thanks to uh, Tom Sargent and Neil Wallace, who first talked about how when a sovereign needs to borrow a lot, uh, it may require that the central bank actually starts accommodating the debt rollover needs of the sovereign. Uh, it could be in the form of uh, reducing its costs of borrowing. It could be in the form of uh, helping it get over a rating downgrade hump. Uh, it could be in the form of avoiding an outright default in the first place. Uh, how does the central bank help with all this? Uh, the most typical way is that the central bank reduces interest rates and prints a lot of money in exchange for government bonds, essentially does monetization of the deficits of the government. Uh, what does it do typically when it does that? It allows inflation to 
go to higher levels uh, than what its targets are, uh, what its medium term or long term uh, inflation targeting mandates are. Uh, and that's called fiscal dominance because the central bank is now distracted away from its mandate otherwise, and it's now focused exclusively in its arithmetic on ensuring that the sovereign fiscal problems don't become uh, very severe. Now, in the traditional notion of fiscal dominance, uh, the focus is on the central bank's monetary policy, which includes the liquidity policy, so the printing of money to monetize the deficits and allowing inflation to run away. Uh, and second, the focus is often on an arithmetic uh, that can sometimes even be pleasant, uh, which is that, that, is, that this is actually the right thing to do for the central bank. Uh, because if it does not actually help the sovereign roll over its debts, it, there could be bigger costs uh, in terms of collateral damage to the rest of the economy. Now, what I observed in India uh, is that when you think about a central bank like the Reserve Bank of India, which is an all-purpose central bank, it's not just deciding on interest rates and monetary policy, it's the debt manager for the government. Uh, so it actually runs the auctions and implicitly believes it has to manage the yields for the government debt curve at different maturities, etc. It's the supervisor and the regulator of the banking system, which includes public sector banks in a significant measure. Uh, it defends the external sector uh, of the country in terms of guarding against a rapid uh, depreciation of the Indian rupee. Uh, and it is also in charge of deposit insurance. So when banks fail, it could be private banks, public sector banks don't fail, but private banks could fail or the equivalent of savings and loans in India, which are uh, sort of cooperative banks, those could fail. Uh, and then it's also the deposit insurance corporation. So the reason why I'm calling fiscal dominance as a theory of everything is because I observed that it is not just about monetary policy. When you have public sector banks, the government wants to lean on the central bank to relax the rules for recognizing bad loans, relax the rules for bringing bank capital requirements down, because it doesn't want to put aside capital in its annual budget to recapitalize the banking system that is bleeding heavily. Why, why does it do so? Because it would have debt rollover problems if it tried to recapitalize the banks on top of all the subsidy programs that it is running in order to have generated these large deficits in the first place. So there you get one pressure point on bank recognition of losses on the capital requirements. Then you get pressure on the debt management side because you want the central bank to get involved in the placement of the debt. If the auctions are not running well, you want the central bank to step in. Sometimes the central bank picks up the phone and calls the banks to participate in these auctions. Uh, and sometimes the central bank just starts participating in the direct purchases, primary purchases of the government bonds. Uh, you know, historically in 70s, 80s and 90s, this is the way India used to fund the fiscal deficits. Government would issue treasury bills and they would go directly on the balance sheet uh, of the central bank. So it was an automatic monetization that eliminates all market discipline on the government borrowing program of any sort. Uh, deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, uh, there, you know, uh, the world over, the preference now is to have a risk-based deposit insurance premium because you want to contain the moral hazard uh, from risk-taking at banks so that they are not taking in safe deposits, paying a flat insurance premium, and then jacking up uh, the risks uh, on the asset side of the balance sheet. If there was some feedback in the system that riskier banks, through proper supervision, have higher deposit insurance requirement, there would be some correction built into the system. But again, why would you do this? Because the government wants to keep the deposit insurance premia for its risky public sector banks low, because if the premia rise, then they might struggle to raise deposits or they would have to fill in for the premia through higher capital injections from the government. And one striking example that I give, which doesn't relate to the central bank, it relates to the Securities Exchange Commission or the board, uh, as it's called in India, the SEBI, uh, is that even the default disclosure norms for publicly listed companies in India are compromised because of fiscal dominance. And the logic is so convoluted, it took me a couple of months to figure out why publicly listed companies in India were not disclosing to investors that they have defaulted on a bank loan. I thought it was extraordinary 
that I can't pick up the quarterly statement and see that the firm has defaulted on a bank loan. And the logic is that if the firm's default is recognized publicly, then rating agencies will find out that the firm has defaulted on a bank loan. The firm will most likely get a downgrade. If the firm gets a downgrade, there will be an increase in the provisions that the banks have to provide for these loans. That will include the public sector banks. So essentially, you would be marking the credit quality of these assets properly. If public sector banks mark their assets properly, the government would have to inject more capital. That would mean a greater debt issuance or a cutting back on the government's populist programs. And so what do they do? They pick up the phone and tell the Securities Exchange Board that, sorry, we are not going to disclose the losses made by our companies to minority investors. So my, my dad has to continue to investing in companies where he doesn't know that some of these companies have actually defaulted uh, on, on, on the bank loans. So I found that the pressures arising from fiscal dominance in India go far beyond the traditional notion of fiscal dominance. They permeate almost every regulation of the financial sector. The pressures are compounded by the presence of the state in the financial sector through public sector bank, through insurance companies that are government owned, through power finance companies that are government owned, through pension funds, because even insurance companies and pension funds, their asset allocations are completely biased towards supporting the government debt instead of the corporate bonds and other fixed income instruments. And so last point here, uh, which is that uh, I, I, I believe the corporate bond markets in India simply can't thrive right now because there's no space. Uh, the government wants to borrow to the hilt. It actually dissaves more than the net savings of the household sector. And if it was at least a level playing field between the government and the private sector for borrowing, uh, you know, that would be something. But not only is the government asset preferred because it is collateral that you can tender to the central bank for liquidity, it has zero capital requirement. But on top of all that, asset allocation rules of insurance, pension funds, etc., are through the state ownership of these entities geared in favor of the government. So private sector is massively crowded out. Undercapitalized banks on top of that only do zombie lending and lazy lending. So if you are a healthy firm in India, you have actually committed one of the biggest crimes in my view, because you can't actually borrow at a decent rate from any provider of finance in the economy, other than the handful of private banks that are lending well or if you are so big that you can actually go and borrow in the international capital markets. So fiscal dominance, unlike the Sergeant Wallace view in India has massive crowding out effects. It's killing the productive capacity of the economy because it has actually permeated all aspects of the financial sector uh, in India. In the book, in the preface chapter, I even explain why it can lead to more financial crisis because it alters the borrowing structure of non-bank finance companies and the corporates. They are forced to borrow more short term because the government is borrowing so much at the long end that they would have to pay huge uh, technical term premium for borrowing at longer maturity. So uh, I think that if India doesn't get its fiscal house in order, uh, it's, 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 it's almost like cancer. It's going to start eating organ by organ, different parts of the productive engines of the Indian economy. Uh, you mentioned quite a few points there that I'd like to get into greater detail. Um, and we'll see later on when we have the time. But the first one I want to talk about is, you mentioned some sort of pressure on the central bank from the, the government in terms of various items. And so, in one of the lectures that you gave, and this was the A.D. Shroff lecture, you said, and I quote, governments that do not respect a central bank's independence will sooner or later incur the wrath of financial markets, ignite economic fire, and come to rue the day they undermine an important regulatory institution. These are pretty strong words, Viral. Will you please expand on these for our audience? Yeah, I, I, I sort of developed a little bit of this uh, hobby of uh, using slightly strong language <laughs> in my speeches uh, while I was a deputy governor at the Reserve Bank of India. You know, some of it is, uh, I would say, the art of polemic, if I could call it that. Uh, 
but some of it was actually just a genuine uh, risk as i saw it uh, you know that speech actually starts out with the example of argentina uh, where uh, the central bank was actually under pressure from the government uh, about 20 years back to give up its balance sheet uh, so that uh, the assets from the central bank would be used to repay uh, the sovereign debts uh, of the government and the governor actually resigned uh and it had repercussions uh, because there were uh, counterparties of the central bank uh, that got worried about whether the reserves are available as collateral for their uh, transactions or not in the fx markets uh, and actually there were uh, calls being made to figure out whether argentina's accounts in the international payment systems should get frozen because the government would actually otherwise uh, take out this collateral uh, in order to repay its own debts uh of course we have seen uh, how turkey uh, is struggling on the external sector front uh, you know uh, every day maybe every other day there's an article in financial times and i think this has been going on now for 2 3 years about how the central bank has come under so much pressure first to get fiscally dominated on the monetary policy side uh, then to get fiscally dominated on the currency side because a lot of turkish corporations are borrowing in foreign denominations because they are crowded out like in india in the domestic markets if the turkish lira depreciates there is collateral damage on these companies that ultimately would come back to the economy and you know have a, a sort of death spiral of sorts uh, so i think the threat is uh, real uh in case of india the reason why we made the speech uh, and used uh, the strong language was to highlight these risks because the pressures on us during 2018 uh, which to just for sake of everyone's understanding that was the year before the national election the pressures were so strong on every front that i described in this theory of everything that i was painting that we actually ran the risk Uh, of the central bank uh, essentially getting compromised uh, on a variety of fronts uh, we we were aware of this risk uh, the central bank had tied itself to a flexible inflation targeting framework implicitly since 2014 explicitly since 2016 we didn't want uh, that credit interest rate liquidity bank supervision bank regulation external sector regulation debt management function that all of these and the central bank balance sheet all of these get essentially compromised through an emaciation of the institution into just one target which was this uh, national election cycle because we thought that the damage uh, that the country would suffer from the lack of Uh, perception of an independent central bank not in the midst of covid in a relatively normal year uh, for india uh, would have been too high uh, i do think and therefore one thing that we were very careful with in the in the book that was sooner or later see because what happens is that financial repression uh, which is one other word for fiscal dominance that is used in emerging markets in emerging markets no one uses the term fiscal dominance they call it financial repression high inflation Uh, setting rules so that everyone is just going to buy government debt uh, all of this are forms of financial repression they repress the savers uh, they repress the real yields that the savers earn they repress the private financial sector they repress the private borrowers of the economy and so on uh, all of these ultimately uh, are ways uh, through which uh, the governments uh, keep their bottomless pit of expenditures as i like to think about it in india uh, ongoing uh, and if you create a huge short term build up of these numbers you can make it happen the markets will lend to you because in the short run uh, you know that all the savings are getting channeled to the government markets the central bank may be aiding it through cutting of rates printing of money buying of government bonds Con, you know quantitative easing has been in emerging markets for the longest time we just gave it a very fancy term in the developed markets but you know in one way or the other it has been deficit monetization of the developed economies out there the way emerging markets uh, used to do it forever uh, and you know somehow uh, developed <laughs> developed country central banks think they found a, a a new tool but no sorry this tool always existed and was deployed Uh, by the governments uh, either 
through pressure on the central bank or the central bank wanting to do it as a way of repressing uh, uh, the savers uh, in the economy to get uh, money into the riskier assets. So uh, all of this can go on for a while. When does it become a problem? It becomes a problem when there is an external shock. Uh, that is one situation. The second time when it can become a problem, if there is a fiscal uh, 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 lack of sustainability on the debt numbers, and worse, it could be a coincidence of these two. Now, just six years back in 2013, uh, five years back before the national election year was in 2019, the year of for our pressure was 2018. Five years before that, India had just had a pretty bad experience with the taper tantrum when Chairman Bernanke announced that they may start unwinding from the quantitative easing and low for long policies of the central bank. India had close to double digit fiscal deficit, close to double digit inflation, and Indian currency was depreciating between 25 to 30%. And one thing emerging market central banks know is that when the developed economy central banks are in an easing cycle, their currency appreciates in what I call as going up the stairs. You know, the currency appreciates gradually step by step up the stairs. But when the developed country central banks normalize, the depreciation of the emerging market currencies happens in what I call as coming down the escalator. So the appreciation happens up the stairs and the currency depreciates down the escalator. And that is exactly what happened at the time of taper tantrum. And it was a very bad combination of external sector shock and fiscal and inflation instability. Where, where did those imbalances get created from? Those imbalances got created in the post global financial crisis stimulus, the fiscal stimulus of India. We ran the risk of allowing that to happen in 2018 and in my view, the reason why COVID shock has not played out so badly for India so far on external front is because the Reserve Bank of India put up the resistance it did in part through that speech and didn't allow fiscal, monetary policy, bank regulation to go completely haywire and allow the macro to be so unstable that when a shock like COVID hit, you just go in a complete tailspin. In fact, India, in my view, has been one of the most stable emerging markets on the external sector front. So uh, just to summarize, Apu, my sense is these risks are very real for emerging markets. There are emerging markets out there experiencing these every year on an ongoing basis. India has experienced it once very severely over the last 10 years. And uh, therefore, I think that the autonomy of the central bank and allowing it to remain focused on the long-term goals is key to India's macroeconomic stability. Uh, when these sorts of external shocks arise and they arise out of the blue every five years, every 10 years, you know, in completely unexpected ways. Thanks. Uh, I think, uh, uh, friends, uh, if you have any questions, send them to me, but I have one more question before we move over to audience questions. And that is given all the problems that you mentioned, Viral, uh, what sort of uh, prescriptions do you have, either financial, either fiscal or monetary or or any other kind uh, that uh, you could offer in the Indian context? Uh, yes, so let me focus on what I speak about in the book, especially in the preface chapter. Of course, I elaborate on all of this uh, in the various speeches that are out there in the book. I'll focus on the fiscal and the financial side. Of course, there's stuff to do on the real side as well, uh, but let me uh, skip that for the time being. Uh, on the fiscal side, uh, I would say three key reforms are needed. Uh, you know, there is the short term stuff, which is to provide relief to the most affected sectors and individuals. But I'm thinking more about medium term debt sustainability and credibility of the fiscal path. Uh, the three critical fiscal institutional reforms that are needed are the following. First, India has mid medium term targets for deficit and debt to GDP numbers, but it violates them every year. And the way it violates them is through off-balance sheet uh, shenanigans, as I call them. Uh, in India, there's a term for it called jugard, which is like, you know, you keep coming up with new innovation every year on where to hide uh, the government deficit and the debt numbers. Uh, and it permeates the entire government machinery. The way the budgeting is done is that you figure out what you want to spend 
you figure out what debt to gdp and deficit number you want to announce you figure out the residual and then you figure out where to do innovations in order to park these liabilities of balance sheet in one way or the other so india needs a an independent bipartisan or non partisan fiscal council that holds the mirror to the government's accounts and vets government's programs before they are announced and implemented because someone has to figure out the financial cost of whatever the government strategy is can india afford it can the government afford it without engaging in massive financial repression every year so, and so we need an independent uh, bipartisan fiscal council that reports to the parliament not to the finance ministry so that it it can actually have some chance of objectively assessing the government's budgets and requiring that if they don't agree with the council's assumptions then the government has to either comply or explain why it's not agreeing uh, with the assumption that's one uh, second uh, as i said the government is hiding its debts in various off balance sheet vehicles uh, it is through public sector undertakings uh, it is through off balance sheet borrowings uh it is through uh, you know one public sector enterprise acquiring another sector enterprise and then paying a dividend uh, to the government in that manner uh so india needs to calculate what is called as a public sector borrowing requirement central government's total borrowings state government's total borrowings and the borrowings of all the enterprises owned by the government of india what is the total borrowing of the public sector because in india now there is evolving a notion of a official deficit and a real deficit every all countries have this problem but in india the gap between the two is now on the order of magnitude of the official deficit so the error is as large as the stated number itself this can't go on people need to have transparency and honesty uh, so you know you can figure out what the corrective mechanisms that are needed and third indian government continues to rely heavily on borrowing programs but it has massive presence in a large number of non strategic sectors of the economy you know banking insurance pension power sector uh, i can just go on and on with this list uh, and you know they should they need to divest stakes uh, that will one uh, reduce reliance on borrowings uh, and get some equity uh, financing for the government uh, so that would uh, ease the debt sustainability concerns second it would allow for a bigger private sector play uh, in these sectors it would make the existing public sector undertakings more efficient uh, if they are owned uh, more than majority by the private sector that would free up uh, the human capital technology and other practices from being that of a government style organization uh, and move it into a more dynamic uh, private sector so those are the three big reforms an independent fiscal council a public sector borrowing requirement that is provided by the auditor general of india Uh, and third divestments uh, turning to the financial sector uh, there are three key reforms that are needed first indian banking sector is perpetually undercapitalized it has never recognized its losses in a timely manner it is always playing a catch up and that means there is this middle sector of healthy firms that are never getting credit in enough quantity or at the right cost Uh, so there has to be a decisive recapitalization i thought this was one lesson we learned after the global financial crisis that you need well capitalized banks uh, to be lending well uh, in the economy uh, second uh, there is just too much of the government in the public sector uh, these public sector banks are run extremely poorly the morale of the employees is very low they are technologically not up to speed in order to get on with the digital economy and use the digital transaction footprint of borrowers to give consumption loans to give loans to small finances uh, small fi uh, small uh, enterprises etc so they need to be modernized uh, and the only way out because now they are also becoming fiscally untenable their costs uh, is to actually get rid of the government uh, at least in some of these that would require strengthening the governance first reducing government stakes below majority and then eventually reprivatizing some of them uh, and third and lastly i would say it's very important that the operational autonomy and the independence of the central bank be safeguarded uh, at all costs uh, 
uh, I think that credibility is what will guard against an external shock uh, as and when it arises. Uh, you know, it's like, it's a little bit like the plumbing uh, of your building or of the city. The only time you figure out that it matters is when it doesn't work. Uh, we witnessed that in Hurricane Sandy, for example, when it hit the New York City. For the first time, I realized how fuel actually comes to New York City from the shores of New Jersey. And if this plumbing breaks down, sorry, you can't drive your car, uh, uh, no matter what is going on. So I think the a part of this plumbing is the operational autonomy and the credibility of the central bank. It will be missed when it is needed the most which is when an external sector shock coincides with the fiscal concerns uh, about the government and through that about the health of the banking system. So I, I spell out many of these reforms in the book and I encourage you to look a little bit further uh, on these. Okay. Uh, thanks, Viral. We are going to move on to questions from the audience. But before we do, uh, I'm just going to make one more plug for the book. Uh, and the thing that I wanted to especially mention is that all the proceeds that Viral gets from this book are being donated to Pratham. So that leads me to another sort of personal quick note before we move to the audience questions, which is that uh, the way I got involved with Pratham was that in 1998, uh, Viral started uh, a version of Pratham SA in New York City uh, and made me the treasurer and secretary of that. Uh, he had started it here. Actually, two versions of Pratham started then. We had friends in Houston who had also started another Pratham U.S. chapter. When uh, Viral went to, uh, and Viral moved to London, I was already in London by then, the, the New York City version that uh, Viral had started got defunct, and the one that was by our friends in Houston is now the usual Pratham U.S.A. But uh, Viral didn't stop with Pratham right in New York. He went to London, and in 2003, started Pratham U.K., right there in London. And again, he got me involved in, um, in Pratham UK in London as one of the members of the founding board of trustees in the UK. Uh, what's my point of saying this? That I think Pratham is a great organization. And so when you buy this book, not only are you getting a great book, uh, where you, it's a, the speeches are fantastic to read and, and you'll really understand, I think, the Indian economy pretty well, but you'll also be donating a part of your purchase price towards Pratham. And so now, and if I could uh, just uh, maybe to... just add in something here, Rapu. Uh, I just want to come back to the bicycle. So, as you know, I took Rapu's yellow, it was a yellow colored bicycle. And the reason why I took the bicycle was because I knew that if it's a yellow colored bicycle, it won't get stolen in IIT Bombay. <laughs> and it never got stolen. <laughs> so, it, I, I was able to keep it for four years to myself. I think that was a great choice of color, Rapu, by the way. But uh, the reason why I think the bicycle example is great, uh, I think of Pratham as partly my handing over a bicycle to Apu. <laughs> uh, after finding the bicycle of Pratham, I think Apu has been a great, uh, it, it, he has carried it forward both in New York, uh, then in London, now back uh, for the Boston chapter, uh, and now in California as well. So uh, thank you Apu for all you do for Pratham. Uh, I think it's in good hands. The bicycle it continues to be in good hands. At some point, you can give it back to me with in some other guys. But you know, uh, whatever you do comes back to you, as they say. <laughs> Thanks. So, so the question here is from Ravi Chitur, and Tarun Khanna has a very similar question. So, I'll I'll give you Ravi's question, which is similar to Tarun's. Uh, Ravi's question is: the proportion of public sector banks has been coming down in India. And there has been a significant rise of private sector banks like HDFC, ICICI, Kotak, et cetera, which are now of global scale. So do you think the problem, uh, I think especially the NPA problem, but the other problems, will they get resolved by themselves? Or do you think that these banks are still too small? Our question is, are these too small to be consequential to stability and dynamism? Yeah, see, uh, I think that's that's a very important observation and one uh, that is quite uh, subtle, uh, I think, when you get into its details. And let me stress one point even further, that not only are the public sector banks shrinking on their asset side in the sense of private credit growth, they are now actually shrinking even in terms of their incremental share of deposits. Uh, so in the new share of deposits that's getting created, they are not able to get much deposits. And in fact, I've spoken to uh, you know, all the domestic help that we had in India and asked them, 
and they don't want actually to be dealing with the public sector bank uh, because they are not happy with the services that they are getting uh, in the branches the costs of running them are now such that you know there's understaffing under provision poor technology etc and you know even even the simplest saver in india the common man now expect certain Uh, deposit services because as was pointed out they can go to another private bank around the corner and now of course there's greater safety of deposits with the public sector bank especially if you get some kind of a governance problem rising up in some private bank which always happens it happens in united states it happens in other countries and that's bound to happen in some uh, bank or the other in india as well but this is a crucial crucial point which is that the rate at which the share of public sector banks in india is declining is too glacial for the level of inefficiency and losses that is a, it has inflicted on the taxpayers you you if you have a car manufacturer that is making faulty cars if they don't fix the car no one will buy the car but with public sector banks they can keep being inefficient they can keep providing poor deposit services and yet only about 5 to 10% of the deposits actually shrink over like a 3 or 4 year period why is it because the deposit that they provide is actually of a higher quality than what a private sector bank can provide you so there is this almost reverse reverse of creative destruction that is built into the system with public sector banks which is that they are endowed with a product which on the asset side is extremely bad for the government and the taxpayer but on the liability side is actually a slightly higher quality in terms of safety so the reason why i don't think we can leave banking sector reforms on public sector banks to the natural forces at work because it's happening the attrition of their share is happening at too glacial a pace and in fact as i said the moment you have one rogue bank in the private sector or if you have a shock like covid which is very uncertain immediately the safety of public sector banks for a short while actually starts working against these uh, creative destruction forces and their market share of deposits again starts growing for a short while and now to correct that is going to take even longer after these episodes happen uh and i and therefore you know in a in a sector like airlines where air india's share has actually now become less than 15% it's still imposing a lot of costs on the taxpayer but at least its share has become less than 15% that's not going to work because it's going to happen at a very glacial pace in the banking system a last point of view which is very crucial here and the audience if i could stress here which is that the real problem with public sector banks is that they get used at the time of state level or national elections to boost credit okay you can't force passengers to start flying air india because you have a national election but you can start using public sector banks to increase their credit quota allocations around a national election and create a temporary sense of the economy booming channel credit to the your favorite vote banks uh, they could be Uh, big industrialists for some governments they could be small and medium sized enterprises as the vote bank for another government so banking and financial sector presence of the governments gets used to pump prime the economy to win elections and this is a big serious cost of leaving them in the system the way they are because when these excesses happen it takes 5 to 10 years to clean them we haven't even cleaned the mess that got created with the fiscal stimulus of 2009 to 12 so the imprint is very very long and i think we have to just get the government out of it if possible if there is political will to do it or because it's just becoming fiscally untenable to sustain with these costs um uh, our rajamani has a couple of interesting questions that i'll pose to you but there is a quick question that's linked to just this uh, the, the public sector banks from parmeshwar garimala who's asking the recent consolidation of public sector banks will it help or hurt the bad debt situation so if you can answer that in short because we have other good questions to yeah on. yeah i'll keep it brief because uh, i think this is not too central a reform in my view see what it does is that it it gives the impression that the government is doing something and and <laughs> i'm not being facetious this is exactly what the mergers are doing it makes it look as though the governments are doing some reforms see at the end of the day the economic size of the sector doesn't change 
there are some minor benefits like you have to appoint fewer members to the board there are fewer appointees to be made at top management there are fewer banks to coordinate when a bank res when a resolution of an nta or a defaulted corporate is taking place but otherwise they are just continuing to kick the can down the road which is that whether you have 12 public sector banks or four ultimately the same misgovernance points use of the banks to do credit allocation in critical years uh, lack of their modernization all of these are going to continue to be problems Uh, and you know you are not solving the real economic problem it is something the bureaucracy and the government can do very easily by writing uh, some ordinances and all that so it makes it look like lot of activity but there's no accomplishment of true genuine reform of the public sector banking as a result of these mergers in my view okay uh, rajamani uh, has two separate questions let me ask you the first one and um, which is are you advocating for higher inflation and embracing higher interest rates to pursue higher growth and as an adjunct to this question and this is not the second question is an adjunct to the first one especially says if so can india stomach a credit rating downgrade which might ha happen as a result of this growth slash inflation trade off Uh, yes uh, so i'm not at all recommending uh, that the central bank uh, allow the inflation to have the runaway pattern in fact uh, you know i have said in my minutes of monetary policy committee which are in the book uh, that in 2019 when the central bank was accommodating that uh, it was taking the rise of inflation not uh, as seriously a risk uh, that in fact has manifested the last three quarters of inflation prints in india have now been averaging above 6% which is the upper band of the 2 to 6% range the target is actually 4% consumer price inflation uh, in my view the monetary policy doesn't have much space to accommodate uh, even the yield curve management quantitative easing Uh, etc that the central bank is doing is one way or the other pumping more and more and more liquidity in the economy the m3 money growth is rising at a time when inflation is very high i don't think this bodes well uh, for the kind of double coincidence i was talking about where the macro is not looking right uh, and you get an external sector shock so i think the central bank should persevere in my view to use whatever it can to actually uh, show credibility towards reining in inflation back uh, towards 4%. See note that when a central bank gets fiscally dominated it actually adopts lower interest rates in the short term but it allows the longer term inflation expectations to become unhinged. Uh, that's going to partly be an inflation tax on the borrowers because the real value of the payments that the government is now due to make in future Uh, is now getting eroded because you are allowing inflation to run away now of course in future the government borrowing costs are rise and so in my view the only way that the debt sustainability could play out in a wrong way is not just because the growth numbers won't go right it can also happen if inflation becomes a runaway risk uh, because that would be coincident with a depreciation of the rupee because the foreign investors will also see that the real value of their savings in indian rupees is declining they better convert their carry trades into dollars before they lose the value by the currency coming down the escalator as i was mentioning earlier i think the right thing to do is to create medium term reforms for fiscal financial and the real side so i'm basically saying that you need structural reforms in india right now this is like a 1991 kind of opportunity for india you know we have not undertaken i would say true genuine liberalization privatization reforms in india other than the 1991 reforms and the divestments of 1998 to 2003 we have been milking them along but now the low hanging fruits are not there so we need transformational structural reforms and that is what will give medium term credibility by putting the economy on a sustainable path of growth uh, and then and if you do that you don't have to worry about a credit rating downgrade in fact you can spend more in the short run if you have greater credibility in the medium term about your institutions your structural reforms coming back to better glide paths on your debt uh, growth and inflation rupee stability and other macro parameters um while well, lee has a, a question 
could you shed some light on the shadow banking situation in india would it be a concern in the short or medium term and in terms of causing financial instability uh, so of course you know i have been out of the central bank now since last july and uh, uh, and you know once you are out you don't uh, have as much intelligence about what's going on so i wouldn't want to hazard a guess about uh, intricacies of where it stands right now uh, in the preface chapter i actually have two detailed pages where i describe what happened with shadow banking in my view the problems of shadow banking were created interestingly and intriguingly by demonetization uh, as many of you know what demonetization did was that in the end through various leakages uh, all the all the black money got laundered it became white uh, so it entered as deposits into the banking system but as i was explaining banks didn't have the capital to make loans and deposits are costly to serve so the deposit rates in india came down very significantly now because the savers were getting only low rates on the surfeit of deposits into the banking system they started searching for yield they wanted higher returns on their savings than what banks were offering so what did the shadow banking the non bank finance companies do they said oh we will offer deposit like products just like money market funds uh, do in the united states Uh, so they started borrowing through short term debt liquid mutual funds as they were called they look very much like money market funds they were investing in commercial paper so short term paper issued by financial firms uh, by other non bank finance companies and by quote and quote higher rated uh, indian companies now world over a feature of financial markets is that you have too much liquidity gushing into one part of the financial system its underwriting standards go down and that's what happened with the non bank financial system they started evergreening housing loans which had suffered during demonetization and with some real estate regulations that were put in place before they started lending to large group companies group companies in india are a complete disaster because they are so complex they start doing related party transactions and ultimately the lender doesn't know where the money is actually being deployed and a lot of money got siphoned out in my view probably back into the black economy through this uh, rerouting of the laundered uh, money that uh, flew in the system post demonetization so what i'm trying to say is that there were genuine uh, bad underwriting problems in parts of the shadow banking system especially in the housing finance but also some in the corporate lending much of this is getting cleaned up uh, by the regulators uh, we were part of that when some of us were at the central bank that work is ongoing uh, what i describe in the preface chapter is that personally i would have liked if the central bank had conducted an asset quality review or a stress test of the non bank financial system at some point over the last few years made it public and gave confidence to the system that those who are not in great shape are being quarantined and being resolved or recapitalized in a decisive manner because there's a little bit of the question that you ask is the entire sector at risk you don't want that kind of generalized uncertainty you want the healthier players in in the shadow banking and there are some healthier players to continue to borrow well the market is discriminating but there is always this one question mark of the sort that you raised in the question that you had um we are uh, running out of time but a last question if you can answer it quickly from pratima i have seen some numbers that range between 15 billion and 60 billion that banks will need so that they can maintain their capital adequacy ratios how will this recapitalization happen uh I, I think it's a, it is actually I think I would say it's a seventy billion dollar question <laughs> as to how this recapitalization is going to happen. Uh, I think there is no shortcut. Uh, I think all options will have to be on the table. Government will have to put capital into some entities for whom no private capital will be available. Uh, for some others, uh, they will have to shed their stakes below majority to start with. They will have to improve governance at the same time. so that some white knights uh, those who are willing to come with 10 15 25 percent ownership stakes uh, maybe technologically equipped financially equipped institutional investors would be willing to come in and help with the reprivatization process uh, and in some cases maybe the fundamental business model has to change why can't some of these public sector banks actually be 
providing the last mile lending uh, of financial inclusion type, which is now getting heavily digitized in the economy around the Aadhaar, uh, the payments, uh, the United Payments Interface, UPI, that's been built, uh, and the digitization that is taking place of the GST invoices of transactions on the government e-marketplace, uh, transactions which are done on digital platforms like on Flipkart, uh, Amazon, etc. All of these are now information collateral uh, that small individuals, businesses and entrepreneurs can provide to borrow money. Why can't some public sector banks actually get technologically equipped to, to focus on these kinds of consumption and smaller loans where huge margins are available in India? And let me end with that last thought. On the face of it, for a country that needs the kind of capitalization numbers we spoke about, you would think that India's credit to GDP must be too high, that there has been over lending. India's credit to GDP is between 55 to 60% of GDP. Even by emerging market standards, that's actually very low. So the paradox of Indian banking is that it has lent too little and whatever it has lent has generated very high non-performing assets. On the one hand, it speaks volumes about the efficacy of the banking system that we have. On the other end, it highlights that if run well, there is a lot of capacity to grow in this banking and financial system. So let me end on that positive note, Apu. Uh, and uh, I wish you all thanks, the very best uh, in the midst of this uh, unpleasant developments on the COVID curve uh, in many economies, including the US. I wish you and your families all the very best. Uh, and of course, I, I see some friends in the participant list as well, both from Pratham as well as uh, from academia. So my hello to all of you and goodbye. If I thanks, friends. Looks here. like we are out of time here. Yeah, we can just jump and in. So, Viral, and okay. thank you, Apu, and let you wrap it up. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, friends, it looks like we are out of time here. So I would like to thank uh, Northeastern University's uh, CEM, the Center for Emerging Markets, as well as the Boston chapter of Pratham USA for co-hosting this uh, very enlightening talk. Uh, I had a great time, I hope all of you did. I would especially like to thank Professor Viral Acharya for having taken the time to talk to us today. And thanks to all of you, my friends, for joining us. Good night. Yeah, thank you, CEM. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Uh, thank you, Pratham, Boston. Uh, look forward to another opportunity to interact with you. Maybe not by writing another book because it takes a lot of time, but I hope you enjoy reading it. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Viral.